Good afternoon. I'm Merit Jane O'Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs. And on this second day of the uh, fall semester and the start of our academic year, it is an enormous uh, privilege for me to welcome uh, Lord Brown to our campus. Um, and grateful to our very dynamic and important uh, center of uh, learning on energy and environmental issues, the Center on Global Energy Policy, to have John Elkind, a senior research scholar here in conversation with Lord Brown. He is um, really a remarkable thinker, uh, an extraordinary uh, CEO, who's motivated people, who's written about the world, has written a number of books, was an extraordinary corporate leader, uh, really a global voice on major issues facing the world today. And I really can't wait to dive into Make, Think, and Imagine, which is already getting extraordinary attention. So on behalf of SIPA, let me thank you for being here today. It's a real privilege to welcome you back to our campus. We'll hope to have it be a recurring visit. And thank you, John Elkind, for this conversation. Welcome, everyone. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure, um, as Dean Jano has just noted, to be here for this particular discussion uh, tonight. Um, we live in a time that's freighted with both possibility and challenge. And Lord Brown's book, um, Make, Think, Imagine, uh, as you see here, um, Engineering the Future of Civilization, speaks to many uh, dimensions of our time. It spans energy, climate, medicine, defense, transport, artificial intelligence, employment, uh, and many other topics. Uh, to be candid, it was rather breathtaking in the scope. Um, uh, it's a story about the history and future of engineering, to be sure, uh, and the role that engineers must play in defining our future, uh, sometimes in a community of engineers, others deeply in collaboration with people from other disciplines, a topic that I hope we'll hear more about uh, from Lord Brown. Uh, to focus only on one piece of Lord Brown's narrative, but that which is perhaps closest to the work that we do at the Center on Global Energy Policy, um, uh, the, he focuses in part on the need to accelerate the transition to a low carbon economy and the push and pull uh, that surrounds uh, that very challenging issue. Just to uh, increase the degree of difficulty, uh, he then reminds us through the voice of one of the hundred some people whom he interviewed, that that may not in fact be the most challenging issue of our time, uh, but that others such as drug resistant uh, uh, bacteria may be. So it is a massive book in scope. Um, it will uh, fire your imagination. It will ask of you, uh, do we have the ability that we need? Do we have the capability in particular to animate uh, humanity's response to the challenges, the plural challenges of our day? Um, as Dean Jano has uh, indicated, Lord Brown has had a long and illustrious career uh, in both uh, international business and public life. Today he is executive chairman of L1 Energy and co-chairman of the supervisory board of Wintersal DEA, uh, a German energy company. From 1996 until 2007, he worked at BP, first serving as a university apprentice, um, which I like to emphasize the university element of it, given our setting. Um, he later uh, moved from those beginnings to become a board member in 1992 and served ultimately as group group chief executive of BP. In addition, he has served on the boards of Intel, Daimler Chrysler, Goldman Sachs, Smith Klein Beecham, um, and many others, including one company known well to us at, at the center, uh, Kairos, a very new and smaller company. He's chairman of the Francis Crick Institute, fellow and past president of the Royal Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the Royal Society, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, along with numerous other honorary uh, societies and degrees. He is the author of several other books, including Beyond Business, Seven Elements That Have Changed the World, 
The Glass Closet, Why Coming Out is Good Business, and Connect, How Companies Succeed by Engaging Radically with Society. So it is really a pleasure for us to have you here, Lord Brown, uh, to hear about your book and uh, what your latest book um, and uh, what spurred you to write it. Um, one can only imagine uh, the scale of the, the work that went into it with those interviews. So please, over to you. Uh, John, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's see if I get a bit close up. Uh, good evening. I, uh, I, I was advised when I started uh, thinking about writing this book never ever to write a book with the a word engineering uh, on the cover because it was guaranteed never to sell and to frighten people because it sets a big barrier up between those who are professional engineers and uh, the rest of humanity, which is a vast number of people. Uh, so I took the advice and, uh, and then slightly ignored it uh, because one of the things that spurred me to write this book is uh, my other great passions, uh, which are in the arts and culture area. And I have, for uh, over 25 years, been involved in some of the greatest institutions in the world, uh, building them, uh, working with great people uh, to uh, get uh, uh, populations both uh, enlightened, excited, and educated by looking at uh, the art of the past and the present. And what I realized was that people were talking about that particular activity and the dramatic arts and uh, various related areas as the essence of civilization. And I thought that was completely wrong. Uh, and I thought that I, uh, because I was so involved in this, I could say so. And so I went on a search and said to myself, I wonder what really civilization is founded on. Uh, and the answer, in my mind, is engineering. Because absolutely everything that we do is enabled by something, a product of engineering, an engineered product. From the very beginning, and if you go to the British Museum, you go to the, the Metropolitan, uh, you will find collections of beautiful hand axes. Uh, these are engineered products, and they're the first known engineered product in the world. They were built beautifully in order to take animals apart uh, so that people could eat a different diet, the start of part of civilization. And at the other extreme, uh, I was privileged to be able to go to the Goddard Space Center and speak to some extraordinary people who were putting together a satellite, a no ordinary satellite, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which is going to be folded up like a piece of origami, uh, put into uh, a rocket, and launched into uh, a part of space called the second Lagrangian point, uh, which is a million miles away. It's a stable point, and this telescope will unfold take 30 days to unfold to an extraordinary, beautiful uh, uh, object, and it will do something extraordinary. It will look towards the beginning of time. And that's extraordinary, and that's another engineered product, and that's about civilization too. So I wrote the book to say that, you know, when you define civilization, it's about engineering. And I want to show you and I want to take you on a journey uh, with people that I've met uh, and I've known uh, to talk about the different aspects of that and for me to talk about what I've done in these different areas. And they're the only areas that I talk about. So there are some areas that I'm the author so I can exclude things. I'm allowed to do that. Uh, and there are areas that I haven't been involved in so I don't talk about them because I felt that I didn't know what I was talking about. So, uh, but I did interview a lot of people. I interviewed uh, hundreds of people, uh, and they were very generous with their time because I wanted to hear from them what they thought about the different aspects of how progress, how engineering and progress and civilization took, part, took place. So that was really my first point. I'm not gonna talk for very long. 
My, my second point is that uh, people look at engineering and it has a great purpose. So we make wonderful things. We make iPhones. They are wonderful objects, amazing things if you think about it, because they don't tell you what they actually are. They're just beautiful blocks. So form and function have uh, been completely taken apart. Uh, they're great things. But there are uh, many, many engineered products, but some of them have intended consequences, but also unintended consequences. So no one who started developing oil uh, and giving this extraordinary um, product that gave us light, heat, and mobility, and freedom, no one actually on purpose wanted to destroy the climate. But it happened. And so something has to happen about that. So what's the solution to that? Does that mean we ban engineering? We ban facial recognition? We ban all sorts of things? I don't think so. It means that we have to do two things. One is, when we have a problem, rather than doing less engineering, we need more engineering to solve the problems. And secondly, we need wise and appropriate controls on what we do. The third I point I wanted to make here is that, uh, of course, romance uh, and ideas often run away from reality. Uh, and it's been uh, something that's happened uh, many, many times before. And sometimes it creates fears, and sometimes it creates false hopes. So the fears are what is going to happen when robots take all our jobs away. That's not going to happen, I don't think. Uh, but what will happen is the work week will probably get shorter. But 120 years ago, it was around 70 hours. Uh, and today, it's 35 hours. And before anyone says, that can't be the case because I work 80 hours a week, I'm talking about averages in the industrialized nation, not specific uh, points. But why, why do we then define uh, work as a 35-hour week? Why can't it be 17 and a half? It should be 17 and a half. Should, why do we uh, say, that's all we're going to do? Imagine sitting here 120 years ago and say, what are people going to do if they don't work 70 hours a week? It's a really bad idea, you know. Uh, and uh, so it's a fear which we need to realize that the solution here is, is the consequences, uh, the results of automation. The consequence is the results of automation uh, and engineering, uh, but the solution is in public policy. So there's some things like that, which create fears, uh, un unrealistic in my view. Others create extraordinary hype and hope, uh, which may not be fulfilled. Uh, the idea of artificial general intelligence is probably a, uh, 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 the delivery of that. I can't see when it will ever happen. Uh, I, I think it's very difficult to define what intelligence actually is. Uh, and so, in order to build intelligence, we need to define what general intelligence is. This is quite difficult. And we have to emulate the thing that created general intelligence, which is the human brain, which we don't understand. Uh, in fact, it's so complicated that I think the number of connection points in a brain, one single brain, exceeds the number of connection points, computing devices, uh, in, in the entire world. So it's quite a, a big stretch. Hype has taken over. There are some very good things, and we can talk about it, uh, about uh, uh, artificial intelligence, but general intelligence is a bridge too far. So it, the book is about realism, too. Uh, and finally, the book is about uh, one thing which I do think is important. It's the exceptional nature of human beings. I think human beings are exceptional, uh, and uh, we are made exceptional by having the ability to imagine. I think uh, the best definition of imagine comes from Joe Rowling, J.K. Rowling, who defines it roughly, I think, as uh, being in a place you can't possibly go to at a time that didn't exist, meeting people who you never could see, doing things that you can't believe at the moment. 
That's about imagination, but actually there's other forms of imagination uh, that push people to do great things, uh, and they step out uh, uh, engineering. It's, for example, in, I met one person, a wonderful man, uh, who at uh, MIT, uh, I'm sorry it's MIT, but it's MIT, uh, who is a, an engineer who deals with the human body and I asked him what his purpose in life was. He said, it's very simple. I want to use my imagination and my laboratory's imagination to eliminate suffering. And I think that's a very good point at which to hand it over to John. <laughs> wow, no pressure. Um, I should have mentioned at the outset uh, that we are pleased both to have an excellent audience here with us uh, today and also uh, an audience watching through the live stream. This event is on the record, uh, and so uh, that is uh, bad on me for having failed to note at the outset. I will also uh, note that I'll kick off with a few questions for Lord Brown, uh, but then we'll come to the audience, uh, both those of you who are uh, here in the hall and those of you who may be watching uh, remotely. Um, in that context, uh, let me stress that uh, both those of you here and those at home can send in uh, questions by using the hashtag uh, CGEP events, CGEP events uh, at Columbia U Energy. Um, so with that, uh, a, a few questions for me just to, to kick us off. Lord Brown, I had the impression as I was reading the book that in some ways uh, you wrote a very candid um, exposition that almost feels like a, the struggle between good and evil. You just spoke about the achievements of the engineering world. You also, I think with great candor, highlighted times when our fascination with what could be done um, got out, outstripped a bit uh, what should be done. And I'd like to ask you to maybe take a couple of minutes and talk about this theme, because it's really one of, I think, the most interesting aspects of the book. Uh, there's a tension in the book that you illuminate and highlight and uncover uh, throughout. Um, tell us more. There's a tension which uh, I think has been around for uh, as long as people have been thinking about uh, uh, what happens in the physical world? When, when someone makes something, can it be used for good or bad purposes? And in the hands of good people, it'll be used for good, and in the hands of bad people, used for bad. So my example, I think, is to uh, ask whether, I'm sure probably some people have seen a, a YouTube video called Slaughterbots. Uh, it's a fantasy uh, video uh, made by a very eminent professor uh, of uh, engineering uh, about a swarm of uh, drones uh, that are designed very specifically uh, with facial recognition to kill individual people and then to, ki then to blow up uh, and to go and target them. So I contrast that to uh, the experience I've seen with drones uh, uh, d uh, delivering medicine to remote islands who are affected by uh, weather events or by plague or something like that. So a great purpose for a, a drone. So how do we handle these two things? So in speaking to the person who uh, made the uh, Slaughterbot uh, movie, which is designed to provoke you to think that bad things shouldn't happen, uh, he said, uh, I said to him, well, do you think you could make one of these things? So he said, well, you know, my, I think you know, a couple of graduate students probably knock one up in 18 months or so. So I said, interestingly, why aren't people doing this? And the answer is mutually assured disturbance. Uh, because if you can do it, so can I. Uh, and if I can control your uh, drone, you can control mine. So I could turn yours back on you and vice versa. So there's a certain sort of tension which is built in. It's not to say that it doesn't always, it does always work. Sometimes it doesn't. But it's a little example, it's a rather big example, I suppose, uh, of something which is, which is good 
at very convenient, very important, saves lives, uh, could also be used uh, to kill. Uh, it's, uh, it's a broader point, I think, with military equipment. Much of uh, uh, the advances in engineering have come through building military equipment. I, I live part-time in, uh, in Venice, that's Venice, Italy, uh, and uh, there, there is a big shipyard called the Arsenale. It was the place where, uh, where actually mass production was invented. Uh, the, the Venetians were very clever. They decided to make ships uh, which had two features. One is they carried goods and they carried cannon at the same time. So they could uh, uh, repel uh, borders, but they could also be used for fighting. And secondly, they were small and agile, which meant that you could distribute a cargo around many ships, so if one went down, you didn't lose everything. And secondly, they were faster. So a lot of things are used for, for two purposes. I can think of many, many examples. Uh, the example of Teflon is overused with the space program. So then could you say a bit more, please, about the role of non-engineers um, in this uh, uh, world of, of innovation and creation that you are talking about. Um, another one of the tensions that I perceived in the book was um, uh, one between the, the need for that engineering-driven uh, development of new capabilities, but then also the different perspectives that come from people who have other backgrounds uh, that they bring to the table. How do the non-engineers fit into the world of, of imagine and create? Well, it, I, I suppose because uh, I think it was a, a, just about a week ago that the Business Roundtable uh, reintroduced a, a very old concept called stakeholders, uh, that uh, companies should not be run simply for the purposes of profit maximization, but for the benefit of all stakeholders a topic that existed before Milton Friedman dismantled it. So, uh, uh, who said that the only purpose of a, of a company is to maximize profit and that's it, and they should do everything within the law and nothing more and nothing less. So, this is a, 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 a reinvention of an idea which is a very good idea. I think engineers, uh, anybody, uh, when uh, they look at things and say, well, we, wh what should we do? We can, we can do something. So they do it without actually saying, should we do this? And it's the should we uh, that comes about by dialogue with the stakeholders. Many of those stakeholders are represented uh, actually in a board of directors in a corporation, uh, which is meant to have broad-based understanding of what is happening around the corporation to make it a fit and proper part of society. But I even not in a corporation, just in general. Uh, people look at what's going on. They don't like what Facebook was doing. They don't like Cambridge Analytica. There is a reaction. Uh, and that is what I think reminds people that it's not appropriate just to do it because you can do it you do it because it's something that should be done and is appropriate. So I think this, uh, this is an interesting challenge and an interesting tension. The big problem with stakeholder management, of course, is that uh, it's called stakeholder management. Uh, you don't manage stakeholders. I suggest they manage you. Uh, <coughs> it's the other way around. Uh, and they also are not necessarily quantifiable actions you can take. It's the sum total of everything that keeps uh, people on the straight and narrow. Uh, and I think uh, I'm all in favor of uh, making sure that people reflect <coughs> that both in the way they <coughs> deal with communication inside <coughs> a company and outside a company. They, are, they should be required to <coughs> talk more about what they do and also in the education of people who go into business or other walks of life. I think it's important people understand that there's more to <coughs> life than one simple solution or one simple objective. Well, and interestingly, 
for somebody who wor um, has spent a portion of his career in government service and now works at a center uh, that calls out in its name the, the role of policy, <coughs> excuse me, I was interested by um, the, uh, a, a statement that you make uh, when you are discussing drug-resistant uh, drug uh, bacteria. You say, once again we see that however potent an engineered advance is, society must use it wisely. And to do that requires wide-ranging vision, effective education, and this is the bit that caught my eye in particular, and sensible regulation. Um, that, those are words that one might not hear from significant portions, at least of the American business community at, at, at present. From others, one would hear support. We do hear support uh, uh, of regulation. Could you comment a little bit about how you think about the role of regulation in, these, in, in, in managing wisely um, new frontier technologies? Well, uh, I, um, I think it's absolutely essential because it's, uh, it's a reflection of the will of uh, society. Regulation reflects the, uh, the, the best judgments uh, for the safety of society, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, therefore, it's essential that people respect it, uh, encourage it, and support it happening. Uh, it, it is easy to say we hate regulation because we all hate rules, uh, but I think that's to be a little childish. It's to say, you know, well, I don't like, uh, I don't like to be uh, well behaved because I want to be do what I want to do, and I don't want to uh, worry about my interaction with society. This is about the interaction of society. It's essential. Furthermore, uh, there should be laws on top of those to enforce what we say people should do and to punish them if they don't do it. Uh, and that is because that's what society has demanded for its own complete safety and coherence. So I think it's very important indeed. I, I think if I may on... Please. So uh, I have uh, constant conversations with a friend of mine who's, uh, uh, she is the chief medical officer of the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, she's, uh, her view is uh, very simple. I, I, I say to her, I think uh, the existential threat to humanity is climate change. And the conversation always starts like this. And she says, no, you're wrong. The existential threat to humanity is antimicrobial resistance. Uh, that while we could probably solve the problem, the time between something happening and getting a solution will be too long and the damage will be done between the two. So climate change, we have a, a slow burning fuse. Uh, with AMR, we might have a very fast burning fuse. And as she says, I hope we never have to understand which, uh, which is the winner in this competition. But these are the two existential threats to humanity. Well, I'm glad I'm working on the easy one in that case. I want to ask you just a, a, a bit more on, on the climate uh, question, and then I'm going to open up for, uh, for questions from the audience. Let me repeat that audience members both here and at home uh, may submit questions using the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle, at Columbia U Energy. Again, CGEP events is the hashtag, and the Twitter handle is at Columbia U Energy. So obviously, you have covered many different industries through your executive and board affiliations. Um, but many people know you because of your leadership of BP, because of being the first uh, chief executive uh, in 1997 from one of the major energy companies to acknowledge the existence of climate change and to uh, refer to it as part of the objective of that corporation to deal with uh, climate and respond to it. Here we are now uh, 20 years later and certainly the science has become only more clear. The progress in responding to climate change though feels as elusive as it might have done uh, back in that time. So I'd like to ask you to reflect a little bit on how you see the progress or lack thereof in the clean energy transition, in the energy sector in particular, but the climate problem more broadly, um, uh, 
Uh, and should we be um, optimistic, pessimistic, or somewhere else on the scale? Let me, let me start by, because I'm not sure that everybody here is, is spends their life looking at uh, the mix of energy in the world. Uh, but it's quite a shocking thing to tell people, this is what the mix of energy is today. 85% is fossil fuel. 85%. 4% is renewable energy. The rest is a mix, including nuclear power. You could say that's renewable. It, it, it is, in the long run, not renewable. Uh, but that's the mix. So the question is, how do we get from here to somewhere different? I think however you look at it, it's going to be very difficult to shift out of hydrocarbons, all hydrocarbons, because they are so powerful. I mean, a cup of oil has enormous power. There's very few things other than uranium that we understand that can create that sort of power. So the transition is a very tough transition, and it's a very long transition. So in that, with that piece of reality, the question is, what do you do? So the first thing in, in my mind is, let's look at the problem that's being created and try and sort it out. So we do two things which really affect the mix of greenhouse gases in the environment. Number one, uh, we produce oil and gas, and in so doing, we let methane, which is natural gas effectively, escape into the atmosphere, and that is a very potent greenhouse gas, very potent. So we have to stop that. We have to stop it. A and that can be done, and the technologies to do that are pretty straightforward. And the measurement is pretty straightforward too. Number two, when we burn hydrocarbons, we have to capture the carbon dioxide which we make. When you burn oil or gas or coal, it produces carbon dioxide and the heat. Uh, and so carbon dioxide is uh, something we produce, so how can we do something about it? So we can capture it, we know how to do that, and we can store it. We know how to do that underground. We can store it safely or else we can capture it and we can make things. After all, nature makes uh, uh, cement with CO2. It does a variety of things. Uh, it also aerates um, uh, Coca-Cola, but there's not enough uh, uh, Coca-Cola to go around to aerate, to use all the CO2. Uh, actually, that was an, I, I was speaking to uh, Secretary Moniz, uh, uh, former energy secretary, about this at uh, MIT. And we went off to have uh, a Diet Coke with each other in a cafe. And uh, the, uh, the wait person came uh, to us and said, I'm sorry, there is no Coke because we've run out of CO2. <laughs> and I thought this was the most wonderful uh, forecast for the future. We've run out of CO2. Can't make this stuff up. Uh, so, and it's true, you ask Ernie. Uh, and uh, so we, um, but you can capture it. Uh, and that's what we must do. Now, surprisingly, all these technologies are available. And one of the things we know about uh, engineered products is the more you use, the cheaper they become, by definition. It's called the learning curve, and it works again and again. So right now, they're very expensive. But if we could push people to use them, then they become cheaper. And the way to push people to use them is to penalize them for putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by taxing it. So the less they do, the less tax they pay. That is something which is very important. And I think that if we're to achieve any reasonable level of, uh, of uh, temperature change in the world, this is something we have to do. In addition, uh, renewables will grow. There's no doubt about it. But they will grow at a reasonably steady pace. 4% uh, is can double and treble, uh, but, uh, and, and indeed, it's getting cheaper and cheaper because, again, we've made more of it. I expect there to be some big advances. Uh, they'll be incrementally uh, generated, but they will change the nature of some of these renewables. And I would expect also uh, that we may reinvent the idea
that we should use nuclear power. Uh, nuclear power stations, certainly in most of the world, uh, are one of the few things that the more you build, the more expensive they become. Uh, I can't think of anything else uh, that has that uh, particular characteristic. But small-scale ones may actually be better to make and safer. They can be made in a factory, and they can be transported and exist on the back of a truck. And enough of them put together in a safe site can make a nuclear power station. That's something which people are beginning to think through, beginning to get uh, permitted, and I think something which really can work. We know it works because inside every aircraft carrier and many submarines, there is a very small nuclear reactor uh, which is uh, powering these things, and we need to make them uh, available for civilian commercial purposes. So, so, so that's what I think about the, the system at the moment. It's very easy to say we should, and, and it would be very good in some ways, just to be able to wish away anything that produces CO2. It, it can't be done, and I think to say that it can be done is to delude the public and to set the wrong ideas in train. But what we do have is we do have the, tech, the technologies, the engineered products available today. It's not as if we've got to discover something. We've got to apply it. And what's missing is public policy, not engineering. It's public policy that's missing. Uh, and that's something that people are building up to. Now, people will say, well, that's all very well you saying that. How will that change? I think that's very much in the hands of the people generally. Uh, I think as we see uh, climate, uh, we see weather events that we don't like. Uh, and we see things changing where we remember that this used to be a nice lake and it's dry. Uh, we used to remember that the flowers came out in, in uh, April and they now come out in March. Uh, these things affect people. And, they, and more and more people, I think, will say, we need to do something about this. Uh, and when enough people say we need to do something about it, then we will do something about it. But uh, right now, uh, that is the only solution. It's the will of what it is we want to do uh, because all these things are things that are not cost-free and they draw forward to today uh, the, the, the future. We pay today to look after the future as opposed to kicking the can down the road and hoping for the best and seeing if we've got a future. Last quick question for me, just to dr drill into this a little bit more, and then I'm going to open up the floor. Um, when I do that, by the way, please uh, catch my attention by raising your hand. My colleague will bring around a microphone to you when she does. Um, please, at that point, introduce yourself and your affiliation. Please state a question, um, a question, two parts of that, a question, um, uh, and uh, then we can uh, keep this moving. The, the last question I'd like to pose goes to the line of work that you were in with BP and that you uh, remain in with uh, Vintersal de A. Um, the energy world is changing uh, in terms of its technologies. The, f the fuel mix we know must change in certain ways. What we use and how we use it must change. But I am curious for your view about the role of some of the legacy companies that have been around, including the one that you used to head. Um, one argument says that they're too big, too slow. They aren't, by nature, disruptors. Others say they have deep pockets, deep technological prowess. How do you score that? Well, uh, I think both are true. I mean, they have uh, deep pockets, they have uh, engineering prowess, uh, and they have the means whereby to deploy uh, different uh, things in the world, different technologies, different processes in the world. But uh, being, uh, but uh, in my experience, the, the most difficult thing in, in running a company uh, is to look at your legacy and actually look at it with clear eyes and say, actually, I don't like it very much. Uh, I might have been part of uh, building it, but I want to change it. And that's a very difficult thing to do because uh, it's easy to say, well, 
why don't we wait another year and another year and another year, uh, and pretty soon, you know, uh, time is over. So you need to, legacy ha is great, it, it provides cash flow, it's also bad because it provides an anchor of thinking. Uh, and there you have the balance to create. Now, some of the companies are doing some wise things to get out of that uh, uh, by investing in uh, smaller companies, uh, trying to understand what they're doing, having these so-called venture funds. Uh, they need to see that through. Uh, it's early days. We've been here before. We've had venture funds in corporations for many, many years. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So I think they definitely have a role. And remember that hydrocarbons will be needed for a, a long time. I think they'll slowly phase out in different ways. Coal is a difficult substance. It's very difficult to get it clean. It, it creates all sorts of health hazards, including particulates. Uh, and it's likely to be the first to significantly diminish. Having said that, that's been the case over many years, but right now it's, it's sort of staying a bit static. Oil, we know uh, one thing about oil, and it's this, uh, that uh, the amount of oil that we use to generate a unit of GDP is diminishing every year. Actually, it's diminished in a straight line from 1985 to today on a regular basis. So if that is the case, and, ex and perhaps a prediction of the future, then we look at the world's growth, and we see that generally the world is growing more slowly as uh, growth matures. Uh, you know, the industrialized nations' growth rates are, are a mere shadow of what they used to be when I uh, was uh, a teenager. Uh, these are very small numbers. So if you know the growth rate, you know the amount of oil per unit of GDP, you can sort of get a gauge of what's going to happen to oil demand in the future. And it is true that all of that indicates that actually oil demand won't keep growing for too long more. Uh, it'll decline slowly one day. Uh, and so that pattern will change. Natural gas it is a very good substance. It does produce less CO2 uh, per unit of energy, but it has to be handled very carefully because if you uh, e emit this, the natural gas to the atmosphere, uh, then you're creating about 40 times the uh, greenhouse gas equivalent per unit of natural gas emitted to the atmosphere than uh, carbon dioxide. So it has to be handled gr with great delicate care. So these things are all the balances. Uh, and th I think the oil, comp the oil and gas companies are aware of this. They need to now show that they're actually making significant progress. Uh, and, but it's not just them. It's everybody. It's what we do. It's how we work uh, and how we think about energy and how with the changing energy structure, how we store energy and use it properly, uh, and we have plenty of challenges in that area still to meet. Very good. So I'm going to open up now for questions. Let me remind you that uh, you can uh, submit questions using the hashtag CGEP events and the Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. Uh, I'm scanning the room for the brave person who will be the first um, question, and so Simona. Thank you. Again, um, identify yourself, yeah, please. Fotis Boliak is a recent graduate from SIPA. Um, Lord Brown, that uh, was a great presentation. Uh, two quick impressions. Um, this book is not a tree-hugging banner that lets get away from the hydrocarbons, but you were more sensible about it. And the second one is the um, nuclear substitute towards the oil. Uh, can you distinguish between fission and fusion? And is it something that we can achieve which creates no side effects? And is it something that is engineered for the future? So I was talking about fission, which is uh, a standard uh, process uh, using uranium decay primarily as a way of generating heat. Uh, it's a, it's a technology which is well known. It has to be handled incredibly carefully, engineering to the highest standards, so everything Six Sigma. 
for those who've seen box sets of, uh, uh, of nuclear disasters, Chernobyl, uh, you can see what happens when you don't actually design the thing properly and you don't make it properly and you don't run it properly. Uh, so all of those lessons are very important. Fusion, uh, which is uh, banging uh, together a couple of, uh, uh, of uh, atoms to create uh, a, a new one and releasing energy thereby, uh, is, uh, is a well-known uh, well process. The science behind it is very clear. We know a lot about how to do it. The problem is we can't actually engineer it yet. Uh, and the reason we can't engineer it is this, that in order to run one experiment, you need to spend a few billion dollars, just one experiment. And you have to build magnets uh, that are so big uh, they take all the magnetic, all the material needed to make these superconducting magnets available in the world for many years. There are millions of miles of cables, all sorts of things. And you do an experiment, and you learn something, and then you've got to take the whole plant to bits and build it again. The process of understanding is very, very slow. So I'm not a, a nuclear engineer, so I went to see lots of them uh, and asked them what they thought. Uh, and, uh, I, uh, and they never really told me. Uh, because it's in their interest, of course, to keep going, to do these things. But a very great man who has now got another job here in the, the United States, as I was leaving uh, Cullum, which is the uh, fusion center in, in the United Kingdom, I asked him, I said, when do you think this is really going to happen? Everyone says 50 years. He said, well, it depends what question you're asking. If you ask the question, when will this be commercial? He said, I will tell you not before the end of the century. If you ask me, can it work once, it will be 50 years. So commercial at the end of the century. It probably will be. It'll take a long time. I don't think we should pin all our hopes on this. Sir? Yes, thank you. Um, my name's George Friedlander. Um, I come out of 45 years at Citigroup. I'm not there anymore. Um, my background is state and local governments. So that's going to be the, the direct government and public policy is the direction of my, my, my question. Just starting with an observation, two years ago the Dallas Fed and the Atlanta Fed did a two-day symposium on disruptive change and the word state, the word city, and the words federal government never came up during that two-day period. And that's an observation of what I see going on broadly, which is that the costs for governments of making these massive transitions are considerable. The revenues available to pay for those costs get caught up in the disruptions, for example, less oil being, being produced, less cars being manufactured, and so on. What do we do about the funding component during the transitions, these transitions, especially in a, starting with a period of a trillion dollar federal deficit where, where infrastructure becomes so hard to deal with? Thank you. So I think we've got a couple of one experiment uh, which didn't work, which is uh, President Macron's uh, approach to uh, energy taxation, which created a rather significant number of riots in France. So we know that doesn't work. Uh, and so the question is, what can work? So a discussion, I think, uh, around Congress here, which didn't eventually get to the right place, was, I think, a good one primarily catalyzed by Hank Paulson, uh, which was, uh, let's, uh, let's tax carbon, let's tax carbon quite heavily, take the proceeds and redistribute them to the taxpayers, to everybody. Make it a progressive, not a regressive tax, which people will, will actually agree to. Maybe take a small amount of that, so you actually force 
the private sector to take action to avoid cost, tax, uh, and you can probably take a, a piece of it uh, and redistribute it to the national laboratories to do some great work uh, which you need to do, but I mean a pretty small piece of it. So I think that's, uh, that probably is the way to fit it into many systems. I think uh, you're looking at Macron versus uh, what uh, Congress uh, tried to do but didn't quite get there. I mean, everybody wanted every single legislative piece attached to this bill, and of course it sank uh, because of that. But I do think uh, there's something in that, which is use public policy to create the delivery through the private sector. And, and therein lies, I think, uh, the trade-off. And I'll shamelessly, as my colleague brings the microphone for it, I'll shamelessly uh, put out a plug for a, a lot of really interesting work on this question of putting a price on carbon that has been done by our colleague at the Center on Global Energy Policy, Noah Kaufman, uh, and several other colleagues there. Please, sir. Hi, my name is Garm Hablil. I'm a PhD student in chemical engineering at the School of Engineering here, and I'm a fellow of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. So my question is that uh, to reduce emissions and to have a more sustainable way to harness energy, it seems like a collective responsibility, not one that one country can do individually. And what you describe as a combination of public policy as well as technology and also having a favorable market for that, it seems to work within the borders of developed countries. So now, if you were to include developing countries in that, which is very important given population growth and that now they're starting to use uh, the forms of energy that we're trying to get rid of, uh, how can developing countries facilitate that for developing countries? So uh, I think I should say immediately I'm not a believer in world government. Uh, I don't believe it works. Uh, and I'm not a believer in one size fits all. So everybody has, I think, to look at what really fits in their nation. Uh, what I think is, should be shared is all forms of technology, all forms of uh, planning uh, and public policy ideas. That seems to me to be a very important exchange. But everybody will do something different. Uh, I remember Prime Minister Singh uh, of uh, India saying at a meeting I was at that uh, he said, well, it's, um, it's a bit like this. Equity determines that every human has an equal share of the atmosphere. So he said, and that I mean literally. Uh, and so I've got uh, one billion plus people. I get a big share. Uh, and you folk have used your share up. So I need to, th you need to think about what you're doing while I do something different. Now, that has a certain logic, except for the fact that, that we've, we may have used up the atmosphere. There's no more room for anything else. We can't actually make a negative contribution. So everybody has to, I think, think about their own role. They can't be forced to do things that aren't right. And I think when you look at the Paris Agreement, uh, it had very attractive components to it, which allowed people to come up with their own plans uh, to achieve a reasonable target and to be supervised, as it were, by peer pressure one against the other. That works as long as goodwill is in place and people abide by a broad understanding of what peer pressure means. It can easily break down because someone says, I want to take a free ride on this, so I'm out. Um, and so, you know, these systems kind of work, they kind of don't work. But we're not going to, uh, it would be a ludicrous idea to, for example, go to India and say, stop burning coal. Uh, the question would be, well, what do we do next? You know, how do we continue our growth? How do we continue supporting our people? It's not, not, a, it's not a sensible uh, suggestion. But actually, it would solve a lot of problems if it happened. But it's not a sensible suggestion. So everybody has to do their own thing. That's why we, we need to get on, uh, uh, because this, uh, this um, rather messy process uh, takes more time than a perfectly ordered one. But may I press you a little bit? You mm -hmm. used two 
very different, or two verbs with different implications. You said share technology, and then you said exchange technology. I, I mean, how do you mean that? I mean, actually, share. I, share. I, I think so. so. On, on, think a, on a non-commercial basis. Well, I think a lot of this is effectively non-commercial uh, sharing. I think quite a lot of it is. And some of it is isn't should be in the hands of government agencies. Okay, very good. I, I'm going to... I just note that I'm now calling on the fourth uh, man in a row. I'm not seeing hands from the women. I'm, if I'm missing you, then throw something at me, please. Uh, I don't wish to have that be a, that kind of imbalance. Please. Yes, um, my name's Peter Burgess. Um, I'm a Cambridge engineer. That's the good news. The bad news is I'm also a chartered accountant, which is the wrong side of the, of the track. But my question is this. How the heck do we pay for what we need to do and do it quickly. I'm reminded of the uh, tobacco problem. We talked about tobacco being bad news for years and years and years, and eventually the world basically figured out that we got to assess the tobacco companies a massive amount of money to pay for the damage that they've done. Is something like that maybe a possibility? I mean, it, it might be. I think these are very different things, you know. On the one hand, I, I really do think tobacco is not a needed uh, uh, good. It, it's not, no one, as it were, needs it. I understand the addictive side of it, but it's not essential for life, whereas energy is. And so I think they are very different things. We may loosely say we're addicted to fossil fuels. Actually, we're dependent on energy, I think, is the right way to put that. It's a different, I think it's a different thing. We may be addicted to tobacco, uh, but we don't, it's not as if we need tobacco to carry on life. So they're very different things. Now, the companies themselves uh, are being pushed to do more. There's no doubt about it. I think that, uh, uh, I, th I think investors generally look at oil and gas companies and say two things to themselves. First is, as investments, many have destroyed a lot of value. So they better stop spending money uh, unwisely. Uh, and I think most uh, investors will look very carefully at how capital is deployed inside oil and gas companies just in case they all go off to the races again uh, and uh, fritter it all away. Secondly, they want to make sure that that money goes back to them so that they can deploy it elsewhere. And they may deploy it in infrastructure funds, all sorts of things like that, that change uh, life for human beings. And thirdly, whatever they say about these oil and gas companies, uh, in my view, they are much more rigorous about saying, you need to take care of your uh, stakeholder uh, relationships, so-called ESG. You know, what are you doing about carbon? What are you really doing about carbon? What are you doing to clean up any mess you have? Are you dealing with governments in the proper way? The list goes on. So I think this form of pressure changes the very nature uh, of the industry, uh, and I think that's probably all to the good. It will probably become more efficient, cleaner, and provide more money uh, for beneficiaries to have in it to use in different ways. So I think that's one. I think the other thing is taxation is very high, of course. Uh, many nations are dependent on the taxation of uh, hydrocarbons. It's a sin tax. It's also a resource tax. Uh, and so uh, that's a very important point to note. In the end, if you tax it so highly, it won't come, off, it won't come out of the ground because there's no incentive. Uh, and so balancing that is quite an art form, uh, which you can see many nations uh, trying, a bit like... Uh, trying to get to the bullseye going up and down the whole time uh, to make sure there's just enough incentive uh, to do what's needed to generate the right amount of energy. This gentleman right here. Yeah. Please, e either one. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lord Brown, um, for the presentation, for being here. Um, my name is Zing. I am a first year MPA student at Columbia. Up till two weeks ago, I was a development engineer working at BP, um, where I was for six years. Um, if I could, I'd like to ask you to share a personal reflection. Uh, knowing where we are now with where the energy mix is and where um, 
how, much, how the lack of, in my opinion, progress in climate change policies they are. During your time at BP, when you were at the helm, is there anything that you think you would do differently? And let me just ask you to pass the microphone to your neighbor just right next door there, and we'll get the, we're, we're, gonna, we're getting close to the end, so I'm gonna kind of jam so, a couple of questions uh, together. So I'm, I'm very bad at these hypothetical questions, but the answer is, first, I, I actually, I, I was asked this question whether I felt, whether I was guilty of being in the hydrocarbon business. I don't feel guilty about that at all, because I do think that the stated objective is to improve the lot of humanity. That's what it is, is to provide people with light, heat, and mobility. I think a phrase BP still uses was invented a very long time ago because that was the purpose of what the company was about. So I think that's right. What I would have done is I would have even further accelerated, if I could, uh, the, uh, uh, the investment in non-hydrocarbon activity. That was very important. Uh, many people thought that uh, BP did it too early, and we probably did, but I would like to have tried to see if we could uh, have persuaded people that it wasn't too early. Uh, we, uh, BP became a company with a strap line thinking beyond petroleum. Uh, that was in 2000. Everyone today is thinking beyond petroleum today. Uh, we should have tried to persuade people even harder uh, for everyone to think beyond petroleum. Sir, please. Thank you. Wesson <coughs> from New York. I mean, I'm not affiliated with an institution. Uh, very political question. What should be the role of government in supporting innovative companies? Uh, I don't understand the intellectual property and the taxation thing, but should the government pick and choose companies sectors, industries, in terms of innovation? So most governments have, from time to time, picked sectors for innovation. After all, the semiconductor industry was set up uh, with some pretty extraordinary uh, in, in, uh, interventions by government. And that's been quite important. Uh, there have been interventions which have been generated through national laboratories in various parts of the world. So I, I think it's sectors, it's not companies. I think picking companies is a very dangerous thing. Picking sectors is also dangerous, uh, but uh, indeed, but some just need a good kick start. There's plenty of government intervention at the moment about energy storage. You know, people want to figure out how to uh, get better devices to store intermittent energy that's generated from renewables. And you will see a lot of government intervention in this area. I start, a oh, woman is starting now, okay? <laughs> All right, Speak directly the to the microphone, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yes. The f first one, you said that, um, my name is Padma. Uh, you said that it's 4% renewable and 85% is foresight. Is it worldwide? Yes, this is a worldwide data. Okay. Because I think... Climate is about the world, it's not about a country. Okay, second question is, the New York State is targeting by 2050, renewal, 100% renewable energy. Is, is it achievable? And how it, uh, how it will contribute with the world so, so um, parameters you gave it to? So the answer is probably yes. It all depends on how much money you want to spend and therefore how rich you are. So for rich societies uh, in confined spaces, you can do lots of things. Uh, it may cost you a lot of money, but you can do it. You can, for example, ban um, uh, gasoline and diesel cars. You could ban them and say, we're only gonna have uh, electric cars. You better make sure that the electricity is generated in a non carbon dioxide way, otherwise you've simply displaced your problem elsewhere. So you can do that, uh, you can say we're gonna generate all our electricity by renewable energy, uh, you can do that. Uh, you need to be careful to make sure you store enough of it because on literally a rainy day or a calm day, you're not gonna generate any, uh, any electricity from the wind and solar. 
So you better have all those things in place. But the smaller your society, uh, the more you can do whatever you want. Uh, it's just a matter of money. So, so while my colleague, oh. oh. One well, more question. Okay. So it is uh, like the renewable energy, you know, the biggest problem is storage, right? Uh, the, you see the, the market the for the storage, energy the storage? So there are several, there are quite a few issues. The one is uh, where do you actually put some of this uh, 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 renewable, where do you put solar panels, where do you put wind turbines? You have to just think about that very carefully. <coughs> Second, you've got to join them up, so you need lots of uh, uh, new electric wiring. And thirdly, you have to store the uh, energy that you don't use and use it when it's not being generated. The conventional way of doing that is with batteries at the moment, lithium ion batteries. They are not the most efficient, they're not the most long lasting technique, but they'll do for the time being. So that can be done, expensive, but it can be done. Uh, and I believe that with the amount of activity going on in this area, there'll be new formulations of batteries, better ones generated in the future. So I'm going to ask my colleague to bring the microphone around to the gentleman here in the front. And while Simona does that, let me uh, note that we will be having, uh, in celebration of this first event uh, of the semester for the Center on Global Energy Policy, we'll have a little reception afterward. Uh, you'll have an opportunity, if you wish, to buy a copy of the book. There are several out there. And Lord Brown has kindly said that uh, in the remainder of the time that he will have, he'd be happy to to sign some of those books as well. Please, sir. We have just a couple more questions and we're going to have to cut it off. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jorge Piedraita. I work for Gear Capital Partners. We provide advice to sovereigns. And um, first of all, um, thank you very much for your presentation um, and thank you for your thoughts. Uh, it's very useful. Uh, my question relates to what is the role of government in sort of this creation process. And it's not, you know, related to regulation in the sense that regulation is a little bit an ex post process. So if I think about that, I think about things like, let's say, DARPA in the US and, uh, you know, ARPA before that, who, you know, between many other things that we can attribute to them, you know, the internet is one of those. So my question to you is, what is the role of government in all this process at as it relates to energy and, and so on. Because if I look at your timeline, let's say, you know, 50 or, you know, end of the century for some processes and so on, we all know that everything can be accelerated with a bunch of money going behind that, right? So that's a little bit my question. Thank you very much. So, so I, I think while I, I say that, you know, we have the engineering process today to uh, begin to solve uh, the climate change challenge, we can't stop innovating. So I think the role of government is significant. It, it has always been significant, for example, in the United States through the national laboratory system, the 17 national laboratories. In the UK, it's through an a entity called UK Research and Innovation. It's the centralized uh, spender of all government money in research and innovation. I sit on the board of that. Uh, and uh, so it, it is therefore about using the money in the places where the risk is impossible for a commercial enterprise to take. And that is the very best thing uh, that government can do. It can attract good people uh, to different form of employment. Uh, some people like to, to be employed in that way, using longer term money to solve problems, but it's primarily taking the risk off the shoulders of uh, the the private sector. The same is true, obviously, in financing, you know, but uh, uh, that's, uh, that's more obvious. Right. And we'll go here, gentlemen w there with the glasses. That will be our last question, for, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Michael Gassmann with uh, Paper Develt. I just would come back to the basics. Uh, you were asked whether you were more optimistic or more pessimistic that we were able to solve the problem at all, given that we have, on the one hand, technologies you mentioned to uh, bring down CO2 emissions like, like small nuclear, um, like um, other things, n renewable energies. On the other hand, we have growing economies and economies have to grow. So will we be able to 
um, reach a decline of CO2 emissions and, and having it uh, stagnant or even solve the problem? And in what amount of time do you think? So I'm, I, I'm by, by my very nature, an optimist. Uh, and I do believe that uh, we still have the pos pro possibility of solving this problem, stabilizing and then maybe and then reducing uh, CO2 content into the atmosphere. Uh, I, I do think, though, that we have uh, an ever-diminishing time to do this. I'm more hopeful in that uh, the dialogue, the conversation with groups of people, with wide groups of people, is more active today than it ever has been. People do want something done. They don't know how. Uh, they sometimes come up with simplistic solutions, but nonetheless, they want something done, and that means that one day it will be done. I just hope it won't be too late. Well, with that, let me just say a word about uh, a couple of upcoming uh, programs that we will be organizing here at the Center on Global Energy Policy on September 9th, which is Monday. Um, my colleague, Sarah LaMonica, will be hosting a discussion uh, about Chile and uh, its role leading the path on solar energy. This with an eye to the upcoming Conference of the Parties under the Climate Convention that will take place in Santiago in December and also in celebration of the 10th year uh, of the Columbia Global Centers, uh, which are 10 in number around the globe. She will be joined by Clara Bowman, who is general manager of AME, uh, Andes Mining and Energy, it used to be. I'm not sure whether in the style of uh, the former British Petroleum, it is now just known by its acronym. Um, Carlos Fianat, who is executive director of ACERA, the Chilean Association of Renewable Energies, and uh, Gabriel Prudencio, uh, head of Sustainable Energies Division at the Chilean Ministry of Energy. That's September 9th. On September 17th, we'll have a session devoted to this question uh, of putting a price on carbon. It's entitled, Getting Carbon Taxes Right. Uh, Noah Kaufman, whose work I referred to earlier, will be hosting that event. He will be joined by Suzanne Brooks, who is Senior Director of U.S. Climate Policy and Analysis at the Environmental Defense Fund, and uh, Dr. Gilbert Metcalf, who is the John D. Biagio Professor of Citizenship and Public Service. Uh, and Professor of Economics at Tufts University. Good thing that's not a mouthful. Ladies and gentlemen, um, please join us for the reception outside if you wish, uh, if you have time. Um, please uh, purchase a book if you are uh, uh, inspired to do so. It is a book that I will tell you is well worth reading. Please last, join me in thanking Lord John Brown for this excellent program and the book. Thank you.